Section 1 of Sherman's Military Lessons of the American Civil War from his Memoirs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Sherman's Military Lessons of the American Civil War from his Memoirs by William Tecumseh Sherman. Chapter 25 Conclusion Military Lessons of the War Section 1 Having thus recorded a summary of events, mostly under my own personal supervision, during the years from 1846 to 1865, it seems proper that I should add an opinion of some of the useful military lessons to be derived therefrom. That civil war, by reason of the existence of slavery, was apprehended by most of the leading statesmen of the half-century preceding its outbreak, is a matter of notoriety general scott told me on my arrival at new york as early as eighteen fifty that the country was on the eve of civil war and the southern politicians openly asserted that it was their purpose to accept as a casus belli the election of general fremont in eighteen fifty six but fortunately or unfortunately he was beaten by mr buchanan which simply postponed its occurrence for four years Mr. Seward had also publicly declared that no government could possibly exist half slave and half free, yet the government made no military preparation, and the northern people generally paid no attention, took no warning of its coming, and would not realize its existence till Fort Sumter was fired on by batteries of artillery handled by declared enemies from the surrounding islands and from the city of Charleston general bragg who certainly was a man of intelligence and who in early life ridiculed a thousand times in my hearing the threats of the people of south carolina to secede from the federal union said to me in new orleans in february eighteen sixty one that he was convinced that the feeling between the slave and free states had become so embittered that it was better to part in peace better to part anyhow and as a separation was inevitable that the south should begin at once because the possibility of a successful effort was yearly lessened by the rapid and increasing inequality between the two sections from the fact that all the european immigrants were coming to the northern states and territories and none to the southern the slave population in eighteen sixty was near four millions and the money value thereof not far from twenty five hundred million dollars now ignoring the moral side of the question a cause that endangered so vast a moneyed interest was an adequate cause of anxiety and preparation and the northern leaders surely ought to have foreseen the danger and prepared for it after the election of mr lincoln in 1860 there was no concealment of the declaration and preparation for war in the south in louisiana as i have related men were openly enlisted officers were appointed and war was actually begun in january 1861 the forts at the mouth of the mississippi were seized and occupied by garrisons that hauled down the united states flag and hoisted that of the state the United States arsenal at Baton Rouge was captured by New Orleans militia, its garrison ignominiously sent off, and the contents of the arsenal distributed. These were as much acts of war as was the subsequent firing on Fort Sumter, yet no public notice was taken thereof. And when months afterward I came north, I found not one single sign of preparation— it was for this reason somewhat that the people of the south became convinced that those of the north were pusillanimous and cowardly and the southern leaders were thereby enabled to commit their people to the war nominally in defence of their slave property up to the hour of the firing on fort sumter in april eighteen sixty one it does seem to me that our public men our politicians were blamable for not sounding the note of alarm then, when war was actually begun, it was by a call for seventy-five thousand ninety-day men. I suppose to fill Mr. Seward's prophecy that the war would last but ninety days. The earlier steps by our political government were extremely wavering and weak, 
for which an excuse can be found in the fact that many of the southern representatives remained in congress sharing in the public councils and influencing legislation but as soon as mr lincoln was installed there was no longer any reason why congress and the cabinet should have hesitated they should have measured the cause provided the means and left the executive to apply the remedy at the time of mr lincoln's inauguration viz march fourth eighteen sixty one the regular army by law consisted of two regiments of dragoons two regiments of cavalry one regiment of mounted rifles four regiments of artillery and ten regiments of infantry admitting of an aggregate strength of thirteen thousand and twenty four officers and men on the subsequent fourth of may the president by his own orders afterward sanctioned by congress added a regiment of cavalry a regiment of artillery and eight regiments of infantry which with the former army admitted of a strength of thirty nine thousand nine hundred and seventy three but at no time during the war did the regular army attain a strength of twenty five thousand men to the new regiments of infantry was given an organization differing from any that had heretofore prevailed in this country of three battalions of eight companies each but at no time did more than one of these regiments attain its full standard nor in the vast army of volunteers that was raised during the war were any of the regiments of infantry formed on the three battalion system but these were universally single battalions of ten companies so that on the reorganization of the regular army at the close of the war congress adopted the form of twelve companies for the regiments of cavalry and artillery and that of three companies for the infantry which is the present standard inasmuch as the regular army will naturally form the standard of organization or for new regiments of volunteers it becomes important to study this subject in the light of past experience and to select that form which is best for peace as well as war a cavalry regiment is now composed of twelve companies usually divided into six squadrons of two companies each or better subdivided into three battalions of four companies each this is an excellent form easily admitting of subdivision as well as union into larger masses a single battalion of four companies with a field officer will compose a good body for a garrison for a separate expedition or for a detachment and in war three regiments would compose a good brigade three brigades a division and three divisions a strong cavalry corps such as was formed and fought by general sheridan and wilson during the war in the artillery arm the officers differ widely in their opinion of the true organization a single company forms a battery and habitually each battery acts separately though sometimes several are united or massed but these always act in concert with cavalry or infantry nevertheless the regimental organization for artillery has always been maintained in this country for classification and promotion twelve companies compose a regiment and though probably no colonel ever commanded his full regiment in the form of twelve batteries yet in peace they occupy our heavy sea-coast forts or act as infantry then the regimental organization is both necessary and convenient but the infantry composes the great mass of all armies and the true form of the regiment or unit has been the subject of infinite discussion and as i have stated during the civil war the regiment was a single battalion of ten companies in olden times the regiment was composed of eight battalion companies and two flank companies the first and tenth companies were armed with rifles and were styled and used as skirmishers but during the war they were never used exclusively for that special purpose and in fact no distinction existed between them and the other eight companies the ten company organization is awkward in practice and i am satisfied that the infantry regiment should have the same identical organization as exists for the cavalry and artillery viz twelve companies so as to be susceptible of division into three battalions of four companies each 
these companies should habitually be about a hundred one men strong giving twelve hundred to a regiment which in practice would settle down to about one thousand men three such regiments would compose a brigade three brigades a division and three divisions a corps then by allowing to an infantry corps a brigade of cavalry and six batteries of field artillery we would have an efficient corps d'armee of thirty thousand men whose organization would be simple and most efficient and whose strength should never be allowed to fall below twenty five thousand men the corps is the true unit for grand campaigns and battle should have a full and perfect staff and everything requisite for separate action ready at all times to be detached and sent off for any nature of service the general in command should have the rank of lieutenant-general and should be by experience and education equal to anything in war habitually with us he was a major-general specially selected and assigned to the command by an order of the president constituting in fact a separate grade the division is the unit of administration and is the legitimate command of a major-general the brigade is the next subdivision and is commanded by a brigadier-general the regiment is the family the colonel as the father should have a personal acquaintance with every officer and man and should instil a feeling of pride and affection for himself so that his officers and men would naturally look to him for personal advice and instruction in war the regiment should never be subdivided but should always be maintained entire in peace this is impossible the company is the true unit of discipline and the captain is the company a good captain makes a good company and he should have the power to reward as well as punish the fact that soldiers would naturally like to have a good fellow for their captain is the best reason why he should be appointed by the colonel or by some superior authority instead of being elected by the men in the united states the people are the sovereign all power originally proceeds from them and therefore the election of officers by the men is the common rule this is wrong because an army is not a popular organization but an animated machine an instrument in the hands of the executive for enforcing the law and maintaining the honor and dignity of the nation and the president as the constitutional commander-in-chief of the army and navy should exercise the power of appointment subject to the confirmation of the senate of the officers of volunteers as well as of regulars no army can be efficient unless it be a unit for action and the power must come from above not from below the president usually delegates his power to the commander-in-chief and he to the next and so on down to the lowest actual commander of troops however small the detachment no matter how troops come together when once united the highest officer in rank is held responsible and should be consequently armed with the fullest power of the executive subject only to law and existing orders the more simple the principle the greater the likelihood of determined action and the less a commanding officer is circumscribed by bounds or by precedent the greater is the probability that he will make the best use of his command and achieve the best results the regular army and the military academy at west point have in the past provided and doubtless will in the future provide an ample supply of good officers for future wars but should their numbers be insufficient we can always safely rely on the great number of young men of education and force of character throughout the country to supplement them at the close of our civil war lasting four years some of our best corps and division generals as well as staff officers were from civil life but i cannot recall any of the most successful who did not express a regret that he had not received in early life instruction in the elementary principles of the art of war instead of being forced to acquire this knowledge in the dangerous and expensive school of actual war but the vital difficulty was and will be again to obtain an adequate number of good soldiers we tried almost every system known to modern nations all with more or less success voluntary enlistments the draft and bought substitutes 
and i think that all officers of experience will confirm my assertion that the men who voluntarily enlisted at the outbreak of the war were the best better than the conscript and far better than the bought substitute when a regiment is once organized in a state and mustered into the service of the united states the officers and men become subject to the same laws of discipline and government as the regular troops they are in no sense militia but compose a part of the army of the united states only retain their state title for convenience and yet may be principally recruited from the neighborhood of their original organization once organized the regiment should be kept full by recruits and when it becomes difficult to obtain more recruits the pay should be raised by congress instead of tempting new men by exaggerated bounties i believe it would have been more economical to have raised the pay of the soldier to thirty or even fifty dollars a month than to have held out the promise of three hundred and even six hundred dollars in the form of bounty toward the close of the war i have often heard the soldiers complain that the stay-at-home men got better pay bounties and food than they who were exposed to all the dangers and vicissitudes of the battles and marches at the front the feeling of the soldier should be that in every event the sympathy and preference of his government is for him who fights rather than for him who is on provost or guard duty to the rear and like most men he measures this by the amount of pay of course the soldier must be trained to obedience and should be content with his wages but whoever has commanded an army in the field knows the difference between a willing contented mass of men and one that feels a cause of grievance there is a soul to an army as well as to the individual man and no general can accomplish the full work of his army unless he commands the soul of his men as well as their bodies and legs the greatest mistake made in our civil war was in the mode of recruitment and promotion when a regiment became reduced by the necessary wear and tear of service instead of being filled up at the bottom and the vacancies among the officers filled from the best non-commissioned officers and men the habit was to raise new regiments with new colonels captains and men leaving the old and experienced battalions to dwindle away into mere skeleton organizations i believe with the volunteers this matter was left to the state exclusively and i remember that wisconsin kept her regiments filled with recruits whereas other states generally filled their quotas by new regiments and the result was that we estimated a wisconsin regiment equal to an ordinary brigade i believe that five hundred new men added to an old and experienced regiment were more valuable than a thousand men in the form of a new regiment for the former by association with good experienced captains lieutenants and non-commissioned officers soon became veterans whereas the latter were generally unavailable for a year the german method of recruitment is simply perfect and there is no good reason why we should not follow it substantially on a road marching by the flank it would be considered good order to have five thousand men to a mile so that a full corps of thirty thousand men would extend six miles but with the average trains and batteries of artillery the probabilities are that it would draw out to ten miles on a long and regular march the divisions and brigades should alternate in the lead the leading division should be on the road by the earliest dawn and march at the rate of about two miles or at most two and a half miles an hour so as to reach camp by noon even then the rear divisions and trains will hardly reach camp much before night theoretically a marching column should preserve such order that by simply halting and facing to the right or left it would be in line of battle but this is rarely the case and generally deployments are made forward by conducting each brigade by the flank obliquely to the right or left to its approximate position in line of battle and there deployed in such a line of battle a brigade of three thousand infantry would occupy a mile of front but for a strong line of battle five thousand men with two batteries should be allowed to each mile or a division would habitually constitute a double line with skirmishers and a reserve on a mile of front 
End of section one. Chapter twenty five of Sherman's Military Lessons of the American Civil War from his Memoirs by William Tecumseh Sherman. Section two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five. Conclusion Military Lessons of the War. Section two. The feeding of an army is a matter of the most vital importance, and demands the earliest attention of the general entrusted with a campaign. To be strong, healthy, and capable of the largest measure of physical effort, the soldier needs about three pounds gross of food per day, and the horse or mule about twenty pounds. When a general first estimates the quantity of food and forage needed for an army of fifty or one hundred thousand men, he is apt to be dismayed, and here a good staff is indispensable, though the general cannot throw off on them the responsibility. He must give the subject his personal attention, for the army reposes in him alone, and should never doubt the fact that their existence overrides in importance all other considerations once satisfied of this and that all has been done that can be the soldiers are always willing to bear the largest measure of privation probably no army ever had a more varied experience in this regard than the one i commanded in eighteen sixty four sixty five our base of supply was at nashville supplied by railways and the cumberland river thence by rail to chattanooga a secondary base and thenceforward a single track railroad the stores came forward daily but i endeavored to have on hand a full supply for twenty days in advance these stores were habitually in the wagon trains distributed to corps divisions and regiments in charge of experienced quartermasters and commissaries and became subject to the orders of the generals commanding these bodies they were generally issued on provision returns but these had to be closely scrutinized for too often the colonels would make requisitions for provisions for more men than they reported for battle of course there are always a good many non-combatants with an army but after careful study i limited their amount to twenty five per cent of the effective strength and that was found to be liberal an ordinary army wagon drawn by six mules may be counted on to carry three thousand pounds net equal to the food of a full regiment for one day but by driving along beef cattle a commissary may safely count the contents of one wagon as sufficient for two days food for a regiment of a thousand men and as a corps should have food on hand for twenty days ready for detachment it should have three hundred such wagons as a provision train and for forage ammunition clothing and other necessary stores it was found necessary to have three hundred more wagons or six hundred wagons in all for a corps d'armee these should be absolutely under the immediate control of the corps commander who will, however, find it economical to distribute them in due proportion to his divisions, brigades, and even regiments. Each regiment ought usually to have at least one wagon for convenience to distribute stores, and each company two pack mules, so that the regiment may always be certain of a meal on reaching camp without waiting for the larger trains on long marches the artillery and wagon trains should always have the right-of-way and the troops should improvise roads to one side unless forced to use a bridge in common and all trains should have escorts to protect them and to assist them in bad places to this end there is nothing like actual experience only unless the officers in command give the subject their personal attention they will find their wagon train loaded down with tents personal baggage and even the arms and knapsacks of the escort each soldier should if not actually sick or wounded carry his musket and equipments containing from forty to sixty rounds of ammunition his shelter tent a blanket or overcoat and an extra pair of pants socks and drawers in the form of a scarf worn from the left shoulder to the right side in lieu of knapsack and in his haversack he should carry some bread cooked meat salt and coffee i do not believe a soldier should be loaded down too much but including his clothing arms and equipment he can carry about fifty pounds without impairing his health or activity 
a simple calculation will show that by such a distribution a corps will thus carry the equivalent of five hundred wagon loads an immense relief to the trains where an army is near one of our many large navigable rivers or has the safe use of a railway it can usually be supplied with the full army ration which is by far the best furnished to any army in america or europe but when it is compelled to operate away from such a base and is dependent on its own train of wagons the commanding officer must exercise a wise discretion in the selection of his stores in my opinion there is no better food for man than beef cattle driven on the hoof issued liberally with salt bacon and bread coffee has also become almost indispensable though many substitutes were found for it such as indian corn roasted ground and boiled as coffee the sweet potato and the seed of the okra plant prepared in the same way all these were used by the people of the south who for years could procure no coffee but i noticed that the women always begged of us some real coffee which seems to satisfy a natural yearning or craving more powerful than can be accounted for on the theory of habit therefore i would always advise that the coffee and sugar ration be carried along even at the expense of bread for which there are many substitutes of these indian corn is the best and most abundant parched in a frying pan it is excellent food or if ground or pounded and boiled with meat of any sort it makes a most nutritious meal the potato both irish and sweet forms an excellent substitute for bread and in savannah we found that rice was also suitable both for men and animals for the former it should be cleaned of its husk in a hominy block easily prepared out of a log and sifted with a coarse corn bag but for horses it should be fed in the straw during the atlanta campaign we were supplied by our regular commissaries with all sorts of patent compounds such as desiccated vegetables and concentrated milk meat biscuit and sausage but somehow the men preferred the simpler and more familiar forms of food and usually styled these desecrated vegetables and consecrated milk we were also supplied liberally with lime juice sauerkraut and pickles as an antidote to scurvy and i now recall the extreme anxiety of my medical director dr quito about the scurvy which he reported at one time as spreading and imperiling the army this occurred at a crisis about kennesaw when the railroad was taxed to its utmost capacity to provide the necessary ammunition food and forage and could not possibly bring us an adequate supply of potatoes and cabbage the usual anti-scorbutics when providentially the blackberries ripened and proved an admirable antidote and i have known the skirmish line without orders to fight a respectable battle for the possession of some old fields that were full of blackberries soon thereafter the green corn or roasting ear came into season and i heard no more of the scurvy our country abounds with plants which can be utilized for a prevention of the scurvy besides the above are the persimmon the sassafras root and bud the wild mustard the agave turnip tops the dandelion cooked as greens and a decoction of the ordinary pine leaf for the more delicate and costly articles of food for the sick we relied mostly on the agents of the sanitary commission i do not wish to doubt the value of these organizations which gained so much applause during our civil war for no one can question the motives of these charitable and generous people but to be honest i must record an opinion that the sanitary commission should limit its operations to the hospitals at the rear and should never appear at the front they were generally local in feeling, aimed to furnish their personal friends and neighbors with a better class of food than the government supplied, and the consequence was that one regiment of a brigade would receive potatoes and fruit which would be denied another regiment close by. Jealousy would be the inevitable result, and in an army all parts should be equal. There should be no partiality, favor, or affection." 
the government should supply all essential wants and in the hospitals to the rear will be found abundant opportunities for the exercise of all possible charity and generosity during the war i several times gained the ill-will of the agents of the sanitary commission because i forbade their coming to the front unless they would consent to distribute their stores equally among all regardless of the parties who had contributed them the sick wounded and dead of an army are the subjects of the greatest possible anxiety and add an immense amount of labor to the well-men each regiment in an active campaign should have a surgeon and two assistants always close at hand and each brigade and division should have an experienced surgeon as a medical director the great majority of wounds and of sickness should be treated by the regimental surgeon on the ground under the eye of the colonel as few should be sent to the brigade or division hospital as possible for the men always receive better care with their own regiment than with strangers and as a rule the cure is more certain but when men receive disabling wounds or have sickness likely to become permanent the sooner they go far to the rear the better for all the tent or the shelter of a tree is a better hospital than a house whose walls absorb fetid and poisonous emanations and then give them back to the atmosphere to men accustomed to the open air who live on the plainest food wounds seem to give less pain and are attended with less danger to life than to ordinary soldiers in barracks wounds which in eighteen sixty one would have sent a man to the hospital for months in eighteen sixty five were regarded as mere scratches rather the subject of a joke than of sorrow to new soldiers the sight of blood and death always has a sickening effect but soon men became accustomed to it and i have heard them exclaim on seeing a dead comrade borne to the rear well bill has turned up his toes to the daisies of course during a skirmish or battle armed men should never leave their ranks to attend a dead or wounded comrade this should be seen to in advance by the colonel who should designate his musicians or company cooks as hospital attendants with a white rag on their arm to indicate their office a wounded man should go himself if able to the surgeon near at hand or if he need help he should receive it from one of the attendants and not a comrade it is wonderful how soon the men accustom themselves to these simple rules in great battles these matters call for a more enlarged attention and then it becomes the duty of the division general to see that proper stretchers and field hospitals are ready for the wounded and trenches are dug for the dead there should be no real neglect of the dead because it has a bad effect on the living for each soldier values himself and comrade as highly as though he were living in a good house at home the regimental chaplain if any usually attends the burials from the hospital should make notes and communicate details to the captain of the company and to the family at home of course it is usually impossible to mark the grave with names dates etc and consequently the names of the unknown in our national cemeteries equal about one-half of all the dead very few of the battles in which i have participated were fought as described in european textbooks viz in great masses in perfect order manoeuvring by corps division and brigades we were generally in a wooded country and though our lines were deployed according to tactics the men generally fought in strong skirmish lines taking advantage of the shape of ground and of every cover we were generally the assailants and in wooded and broken countries the defensive had a positive advantage over us for they were always ready had cover and always knew the ground to their immediate front whereas we their assailants had to grope our way over unknown ground and generally found a cleared field or prepared entanglements that held us for a time under a close and withering fire rarely did the opposing lines in compact order come into actual contact but when as at peach tree creek and atlanta the lines did become commingled the men fought individually in every possible style more frequently with a musket clubbed than with a bayonet 
and in some instances the men clinched like wrestlers and went to the ground together europeans frequently criticized our war because we did not always take full advantage of a victory the true reason was that habitually the woods served as a screen and we often did not realize the fact that our enemy had retreated till he was already miles away and was again entrenched having left a mere skirmish line to cover the movement in turn to fall back to the new position our war was fought with the muzzle-loading rifle toward the close i had one brigade walcutts armed with breech-loading spencers the cavalry generally had breech-loading carbines spencers and sharps both of which were good arms the only change that breech-loading arms will probably make in the art and practice of war will be to increase the amount of ammunition to be expended and necessarily to be carried along to still further thin out the lines of attack and to reduce battles to short quick decisive conflicts it does not in the least affect the grand strategy or the necessity for perfect organization drill and discipline the companies and battalions will be more dispersed and the men will be less under the immediate eye of their officers and therefore a higher order of intelligence and courage on the part of the individual soldier will be an element of strength when a regiment is deployed as skirmishers and crosses an open field or woods under heavy fire if each man runs forward from tree to tree or stump to stump and yet preserves a good general alignment it gives great confidence to the men themselves for they always keep their eyes well to the right and left and watch their comrades but when some few hold back stick too close or too long to a comfortable log it often stops the line and defeats the whole object therefore the more we improve the firearm the more will be the necessity for good organization good discipline and intelligence on the part of the individual soldier and officer there is of course such a thing as individual courage which has a value in war but familiarity with danger experience in war and its common attendants and personal habit are equally valuable traits and these are the qualities with which we usually have to deal in war all men naturally shrink from pain and danger and only incur their risk from some higher motive or from habit so that i would define true courage to be a perfect sensibility of the measure of danger and a mental willingness to incur it rather than that insensibility to danger of which i have heard far more than i have seen the most courageous men are generally unconscious of possessing the quality therefore when one professes it too openly by words or bearing there is reason to mistrust it i would rather illustrate my meaning by describing a man of true courage to be one who possesses all his faculties and senses perfectly when serious danger is actually present modern wars have not materially changed the relative value or proportions of the several arms of service infantry artillery cavalry and engineers if anything the infantry has been increased in value the danger of cavalry attempting to charge infantry armed with breech-loading rifles was fully illustrated at sedan and with us very frequently so improbable has such a thing become that we have omitted the infantry square from our recent tactics still cavalry against cavalry and as auxiliary to infantry will always be valuable while all great wars will as heretofore depend chiefly on the infantry artillery is more valuable with new and inexperienced troops than with veterans in the early stages of the war the field guns often bore the proportion of six to a thousand men but toward the close of the war one gun or at most two to a thousand men was deemed enough sieges such as characterized the wars of the last century are too slow for this period of the world and the prussians recently almost ignored them altogether penetrated france between the forts and left a superior force in observation to watch the garrison and accept its surrender when the greater events of the war ahead made further resistance useless 
but earth forts and especially field forts will hereafter play an important part in war because they enable a minor force to hold a superior one in check for a time and time is a most valuable element in all wars it was one of professor mahan's maxims that the spade was as useful in war as the musket and to this i will add the axe the habit of entrenching certainly does have the effect of making new troops timid when a line of battle is once covered by a good parapet made by the engineers or by the labor of the men themselves it does require an effort to make them leave it in the face of danger but when the enemy is entrenched it becomes absolutely necessary to permit each brigade and division of the troops immediately opposed to throw up a corresponding trench for their own protection in case of a sudden sally we invariably did this in all our recent campaigns and it had no ill effect though sometimes our troops were a little too slow in leaving their well-covered lines to assail the enemy in position or on retreat even our skirmishers were in the habit of rolling logs together or of making a lunette of rails with dirt in front to cover their bodies and though it revealed their position i cannot say that it worked a bad effect so that as a rule it may safely be left to the men themselves on the defensive there is no doubt of the propriety of fortifying but in the assailing army the general must watch closely to see that his men do not neglect an opportunity to drop his precautionary defence and act promptly on the offensive at every chance i have many a time crept forward to the skirmish line to avail myself of the cover of the picket's little fort to observe more closely some expected result and always talked familiarly with the men and was astonished to see how well they comprehended the general object and how accurately they were informed of the state of facts existing miles away from their particular corps soldiers are very quick to catch the general drift and purpose of a campaign and are always sensible when they are well commanded or well cared for once impressed with this fact and that they are making progress they bear cheerfully any amount of labor and privation in camp and especially in the presence of an active enemy it is much easier to maintain discipline than in barracks in time of peace crime and breaches of discipline are much less frequent and the necessity for courts martial far less the captain can usually inflict all the punishment necessary and the colonel should always the field officers court is the best form for war viz one of the field officers the lieutenant colonel or major can examine the case and report his verdict and the colonel should execute it of course there are statutory offences which demand a general court-martial and these must be ordered by the division or corps commander but the presence of one of our regular civilian judge advocates in an army in the field would be a first-class nuisance for technical courts always work mischief too many courts martial in any command are evidence of poor discipline and inefficient officers end of section two chapter twenty five of sherman's military lessons of the american civil war from his memoirs by william tecumseh sherman section three this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five conclusion military lessons of the war section three for the rapid transmission of orders in an army covering a large space of ground the magnetic telegraph is by far the best though habitually the paper and pencil with good mounted orderlies answer every purpose i have little faith in the signal service by flags and torches though we always used them because almost invariably when they were most needed the view was cut off by intervening trees or by mists and fogs there was one notable instance in my experience when the signal flags carried a message of vital importance over the heads of hood's army which had interposed between me and alatuna and had broken the telegraph wires as recorded in chapter nineteen but the value of the magnetic telegraph in war cannot be exaggerated 
as was illustrated by the perfect concert of action between the armies in virginia and georgia during eighteen sixty four hardly a day intervened when general grant did not know the exact state of facts with me more than fifteen hundred miles away as the wires ran so on the field a thin insulated wire may be run on improvised stakes or from tree to tree for six or more miles in a couple of hours and i have seen operators so skilful that by cutting the wire they would receive a message with their tongues from a distant station as a matter of course the ordinary commercial wires along the railways form the usual telegraph lines for an army and these are easily repaired and extended as the army advances but each army and wing should have a small party of skilled men to put up the field wire and take it down when done this is far better than the signal flags and torches our commercial telegraph lines will always supply for war enough skilful operators the value of railways was also fully recognized in war quite as much as if not more so than in peace the atlanta campaign would simply have been impossible without the use of the railroad from louisville to nashville one hundred and eighty five miles from nashville to chattanooga one hundred and fifty one miles and from chattanooga to atlanta one hundred and thirty seven miles every mile of this single track was so delicate that one man could in a minute have broken or moved a rail but our trains usually carried along the tools and means to repair such a break we had however to maintain strong guards and garrisons at each important bridge or trestle the destruction of which would have necessitated time for rebuilding for the protection of a bridge one or two log block houses two stories high with a piece of ordnance and a small infantry guard usually sufficed the block house had a small parapet and ditch about it and the roof was made shot-proof by earth piled on these points could usually be reached only by a dash of the enemy's cavalry and many of these blockhouses successfully resisted serious attacks by both cavalry and artillery the only blockhouse that was actually captured on the main was the one described near alatoona our trains from nashville forward were operated under military rules and ran about ten miles an hour in gangs of four trains of ten cars each four such groups of trains daily made one hundred and sixty cars of ten tons each carrying sixteen hundred tons which exceeded the absolute necessity of the army and allowed for the accidents that were common and inevitable but as i have recorded that single stem of railroad four hundred and seventy three miles long supplied an army of one hundred thousand men and thirty five thousand animals for the period of one hundred and ninety six days viz from may one to november twelve eighteen sixty four to have delivered regularly that amount of food and forage by ordinary wagons would have required thirty six thousand eight hundred wagons of six mules each allowing each wagon to have hauled two tons twenty miles each day a simple impossibility in roads such as then existed in that region of country therefore i reiterate that the atlanta campaign was an impossibility without these railroads and only then because we had the men and means to maintain and defend them in addition to what were necessary to overcome the enemy habitually a passenger car will carry fifty men with their necessary baggage box cars and even platform cars answer the purpose well enough but they should always have rough board seats for sick and wounded men box cars filled with straw or bushes were usually employed personally i saw but little of the practical working of the railroads for i only turned back once as far as resaca but i had daily reports from the engineer in charge and officers who came from the rear often explained to me the whole thing with the description of the wrecked trains all the way from nashville to atlanta i am convinced that the risk to life to the engineers and men on that railroad fully equalled that on the skirmish line called for as high an order of courage and fully equalled it in importance 
still i doubt if there be any necessity in time of peace to organize a corps specially to work the military railroads in time of war because in peace these same men gain all the necessary experience possess all the daring and courage of soldiers and only need the occasional protection and assistance of the necessary train guard which may be composed of the furloughed men coming and going or of details made from the local garrison to the rear for the transfer of large armies by rail from one theatre of action to another by the rear the cases of the transfer of the eleventh and twelfth corps general hooker twenty three thousand men from the east to chattanooga eleven hundred and ninety two miles in seven days in the fall of eighteen sixty three and that of the army of the ohio general schofield fifteen thousand men from the valley of the tennessee to washington fourteen hundred miles in eleven days en route to north carolina in january eighteen sixty five are the best examples of which i have any knowledge and reference to these is made in the report of the secretary of war mr stanton dated november twenty two eighteen sixty five engineer troops attached to an army are habitually employed in supervising the construction of forts or field-works of a nature more permanent than the lines needed by the troops in motion and in repairing roads and making bridges i had several regiments of this kind that were most useful but as a rule we used the infantry or employed parties of freedmen who worked on the trenches at night while the soldiers slept and these in turn rested by day habitually the repair of the railroad and its bridges was committed to hired laborers like the english navvies under the supervision of colonel w w wright a railroad engineer who was in the military service at the time and his successful labors were frequently referred to in the official reports of the campaign for the passage of rivers each army corps had a pontoon train with a detachment of engineers and on reaching a river the leading infantry division was charged with the labor of putting it down generally the single pontoon train could provide for nine hundred feet of bridge which sufficed but when the rivers were very wide two such trains would be brought together or the single train was supplemented by a trestle bridge or bridges made on crib work out of timber found near the place the pontoons in general use were skeleton frames made with a hinge so as to fold back and constitute a wagon body in this same wagon were carried the cotton canvas cover the anchor and chains and a due proportion of the balks cheeses and lashings all the troops became very familiar with their mechanism and use and we were rarely delayed by reason of a river however broad i saw recently in aldershot england a very complete pontoon train the boats were sheathed with wood and felt made very light but i think these were more liable to chafing and damage in rough handling than were our less expensive and rougher boats on the whole i would prefer the skeleton frame and canvas cover to any style of pontoon that i have ever seen in relation to guards pickets and vedettes i doubt if any discoveries or improvements were made during our war or in any of the modern wars in europe these precautions vary with the nature of the country and the situation of each army when advancing or retreating in line of battle the usual skirmish line constitutes the picket line and may have reserves but usually the main line of battle constitutes the reserve and in this connection i will state that the recent innovation introduced into the new infantry tactics by general upton is admirable for by it each regiment brigade and division deployed sends forward as skirmishers the one man of each set of fours to cover its own front and these can be recalled or reinforced at pleasure by the bugle signal for flank guards and rear guards one or more companies should be detached under their own officers instead of making up the guard by detailing men from the several companies for regimental or camp guards the details should be made according to existing army regulations and all the guards should be posted early in the evening so as to afford each sentinel or vedette a chance to study his ground before it becomes too dark in like manner as to the staff 
the more intimately it comes into contact with the troops the more useful and valuable it becomes the almost entire separation of the staff from the line as now practised by us and hitherto by the french has proved mischievous and the great retinues of staff officers with which some of our earlier generals began the war were simply ridiculous i don't believe in a chief of staff at all and any general commanding an army corps or division that has a staff officer who professes to know more than his chief is to be pitied each regiment should have a competent adjutant quartermaster and commissary with two or three medical officers each brigade commander should have the same staff with the addition of a couple of young aides-de-camp habitually selected from the subalterns of the brigade who should be good riders and intelligent enough to give and explain the orders of their general the same staff will answer for a division the general in command of a separate army and of a corps d'armee should have the same professional assistance with two or more good engineers and his adjutant-general should exercise all the functions usually ascribed to a chief of staff viz he should possess the ability to comprehend the scope of operations and to make verbally and in writing all the orders and details necessary to carry into effect the views of his general as well as to keep the returns and records of events for the information of the next higher authority and for history a bulky staff implies a division of responsibility slowness of action and indecision whereas a small staff implies activity and concentration of purpose the smallness of general grant's staff throughout the civil war forms the best model for future imitation so of tents officers furniture etc etc in real war these should all be discarded and an army is efficient for action and motion exactly in the inverse ratio of its impedimenta tents should be omitted altogether save one to a regiment for an office and a few for the division hospital officers should be content with a tent fly improvising poles and shelters out of bushes the tents d'abri or shelter tent carried by the soldier himself is all sufficient officers should never seek for houses but share the condition of their men a recent message july eighteen eighteen seventy four made to the french assembly by marshal macmahon president of the french republic submits a projet de loi with a report prepared by a board of french generals on army administration which is full of information and is as applicable to us as to the french i quote from its very beginning the misfortunes of the campaign of eighteen seventy have demonstrated the inferiority of our system two separate organizations existed with parallel functions the general more occupied in giving direction to his troops than in providing for their material wants which he regarded as the special province of the staff and the intendant staff often working at random taking on his shoulders a crushing burden of functions and duties exhausting himself with useless efforts and aiming to accomplish an insufficient service to the disappointment of everybody this separation of the administration and command this coexistence of two wills each independent of the other which paralyzed both and annulled the dualism was condemned it was decided by the board that this error should be proscribed in the new military system the report then goes on at great length discussing the provisions of the new law which is described to be a radical change from the old one on the same subject while conceding to the minister of war in paris the general control and supervision of the entire military establishment primarily especially of the annual estimates or budget and the great depots of supply it distributes to the commanders of the corps d'armee in time of peace and to all army commanders generally in time of war the absolute command of the money provisions and stores with the necessary staff officers to receive issue and account for them i quote further 
the object of this law is to confer on the commander of troops whatever liberty of action the case demands he has the power even to go beyond the regulations in circumstances of urgency and pressing necessity the extraordinary measures he may take on these occasions may require their execution without delay the staff officer has but one duty before obeying and that is to submit his observations to the general and to ask his orders in writing with this formality his responsibility ceases and the responsibility for the extraordinary act falls solely on the general who gives the order the officers and agents charged with supplies are placed under the orders of the general in command of the troops that is they are obliged both in war and peace to obey with the single qualification above named of first making their observations and securing the written order of the general with us to-day the law and regulations are that no matter what may be the emergency the commanding general in texas new mexico and the remote frontiers cannot draw from the arsenals a pistol cartridge or any sort of ordnance stores without first procuring an order of the secretary of war in washington the commanding general though entrusted with the lives of his soldiers and with the safety of a frontier in a condition of chronic war cannot touch or be trusted with ordnance stores or property and that is declared to be the law every officer of the old army remembers how in eighteen sixty one we were hampered with the old blue army regulations which tied our hands and that to do anything positive and necessary we had to tear it all to pieces cut the red tape as it was called a dangerous thing for an army to do for it was calculated to bring the law and authority into contempt but war was upon us and overwhelming necessity overrides all law this french report is well worth the study of our army officers of all grades and classes and i will only refer again casually to another part wherein it discusses the subject of military correspondence whether the staff officer should correspond directly with his chief in paris submitting to his general copies or whether he should be required to carry on his correspondence through his general so that the latter could promptly forward the communication endorsed with his own remarks and opinions the latter is declared by the board to be the only safe role because the general should never be ignorant of anything that is transpiring that concerns his command in this country as in france congress controls the great questions of war and peace makes all laws for the creation and government of armies and votes the necessary supplies leaving to the president to execute and apply these laws especially the harder task of limiting the expenditure of public money to the amount of the annual appropriations the executive power is further subdivided into the seven great departments and to the secretary of war is confided the general care of the military establishment and his powers are further subdivided into ten distinct and separate bureaus the chiefs of these bureaus are under the immediate orders of the secretary of war who through them in fact commands the army from his office but cannot do so in the field an absurdity in military if not civil law the subordinates of these staff corps and departments are selected and chosen from the army itself or fresh from west point and too commonly construe themselves into the elite as made of better clay than the common soldier thus they separate themselves more and more from their comrades of the line and in process of time realize the condition of that old officer of artillery who thought the army would be a delightful place for a gentleman if it were not for the damned soldier or better still the conclusion of the young lord in henry the fourth who told harry percy hotspur that but for these vile guns he would himself have been a soldier this is all wrong utterly at variance with our democratic form of government and of universal experience and now that the french from whom we had copied the system have utterly proscribed it i hope that our congress will follow suit i admit in its fullest force the strength of the maxim that the civil law should be superior to the military in time of peace 
that the army should be at all times subject to the direct control of congress and i assert that from the formation of our government to the present day the regular army has set the highest example of obedience to law and authority but for the very reason that our army is comparatively so very small i hold that it should be the best possible organized and governed on true military principles and that in time of peace we should preserve the habits and usages of war so that when war does come we may not again be compelled to suffer the disgrace confusion and disorder of eighteen sixty one the commanding officers of divisions, departments, and posts should have the amplest powers not only to command their troops, but all the stores designed for their use, and the officers of the staff necessary to administer them within the area of their command, and then with fairness they could be held to the most perfect responsibility the president and secretary of war can command the army quite as well through these generals as through the subordinate staff officers of course the secretary would as now distribute the funds according to the appropriation bills and reserve to himself the absolute control and supervision of the larger arsenals and depots of supply the error lies in the law or in the judicial interpretation thereof and no code of army regulations can be made that meets the case until congress like the french corps législatif utterly annihilates and proscribes the old law and the system which has grown up under it it is related of napoleon that his last words were tete d'armee doubtless as the shadow of death obscured his memory the last thought that remained for speech was of some event when he was directing an important head of column i believe that every general who has handled armies in battles must recall from his own experience the intensity of thought on some similar occasion when by a single command he had given the finishing stroke to some complicated action but to me recurs another thought that is worthy of record and may encourage others who are to follow us in our profession i never saw the rear of an army engaged in battle but i feared that some calamity had happened at the front the apparent confusion broken wagons crippled horses men lying about dead and maimed parties hastening to and fro in seeming disorder and a general apprehension of something dreadful about to ensue all these signs however lessened as i neared the front and there the contrast was complete perfect order men and horses full of confidence and it was not unusual for general hilarity laughing and cheering although cannon might be firing the musketry clattering and the enemy's shot hitting close there reigned a general feeling of strength and security that bore a marked contrast to the bloody signs that had drifted rapidly to the rear therefore for comfort and safety i surely would rather be at the front than the rear line of battle so also on the march the head of a column moves on steadily while the rear is alternately halting and then rushing forward to close up the gap and all sorts of rumours especially the worst float back to the rear old troops invariably deem it a special privilege to be in the front to be at the head of column because experience has taught them that it is the easiest and most comfortable place and danger only adds zest and stimulus to this fact the hardest task in war is to lie in support of some position or battery under fire without the privilege of returning it or to guard some train left in the rear within hearing but out of danger or to provide for the wounded and dead of some corps which is too busy ahead to care for its own to be at the head of a strong column of troops in the execution of some task that requires brain is the highest pleasure of war a grim one and terrible but which leaves on the mind and memory the strongest mark to detect the weak point of an enemy's line to break through with vehemence and thus lead to victory or to discover some key point and hold it with tenacity or to do some other distinct act which is afterward recognized as the real cause of success these all become matters that are never forgotten 
other great difficulties experienced by every general are to measure truly the thousand and one reports that come to him in the midst of conflict to preserve a clear and well-defined purpose at every instant of time and to cause all efforts to converge to that end to do these things he must know perfectly the strength and quality of each part of his own army as well as that of his opponent and must be where he can personally see and observe with his own eyes and judge with his own mind no man can properly command an army from the rear he must be at its front and when a detachment is made the commander thereof should be informed of the object to be accomplished and left as free as possible to execute it in his own way and when an army is divided up into several parts the superior should always attend that one which he regards as most important some men think that modern armies may be so regulated that a general can sit in an office and play on his several columns as on the keys of a piano this is a fearful mistake the directing mind must be at the very head of the army must be seen there and the effect of his mind and personal energy must be felt by every officer and man present with it to secure the best results every attempt to make war easy and safe will result in humiliation and disaster lastly mail facilities should be kept up with an army if possible that officers and men may receive and send letters to their friends thus maintaining the home influence of infinite assistance to discipline newspaper correspondents with an army as a rule are mischievous they are the world's gossips pick up and retail the camp scandal and gradually drift to the headquarters of some general who finds it easier to make reputation at home than with his own corps or division they are also tempted to prophesy events and state facts which to an enemy reveal a purpose in time to guard against it moreover they are always bound to see facts coloured by the partisan or political character of their own patrons and thus bring army officers into the political controversies of the day which are always mischievous and wrong yet so greedy are the people at large for war news that it is doubtful whether any army commander can exclude all reporters without bringing down on himself a clamour that may imperil his own safety time and moderation must bring a just solution to this modern difficulty end of section three end of sherman's military lessons of the american civil war from his memoirs by william tecumseh sherman